where he pains the nuns to love her as much as they do, given her apostasy. When the air has ceased to rustle and her scent has dissipated, Waldo tells his roommate Abelardo that he would ask his sister to marry him if only she were not so fearless. Abelardo would shrug if he ever shrugged. He tells Waldo it is a moot point because his sister will never again leave Nicaragua, though he is wrong about this. And he asks Waldo, how fearless can that be? Um, that's the problem. 12 years later, the book starts, and um, Waldo does not marry Carmen. And the book is narrated by the woman he does, in fact, marry, whose name is Alice. So I'll just read a little bit of this. <coughs> my name is Alice Hewan Fairbairn. It used to be Alice Yvette Hewan, because Yvette was my mother's maiden name. All three sisters got the same middle name. I stopped using Yvette when I became a Fairweather. Why? Because I was madly in love. Given what happened, it would have been somewhat amusing if Yvette were still on my passport. Because in Spanish, ve and me are basically the same letter. Letter, writ small, ve pequeño, or writ large, ve grande. About two months before Waldo and the boys went on vacation, I lost my job hosting the dream radio show, Monday mornings for three hours on WBLT. Start your, way by, start your week by freeing up your subconscious. Tell me, Alice Fairweather, and our listeners in the Tri-State area last night's dream, and we'll tell you the obvious. The events were not related in any way. I was sacked in December. You'd think that even the dimmest station manager would realize that it is especially in the trying holiday times that listeners need to be able to tell their dreams live and be reassured. But no, without the slightest consideration for the spirit of Baby Jesus or Rockefeller Center, Trudy Swatherton, in an act of generosity so rare it should have alerted me to the coming blow, took me to Joe's rib joint, and then she fired me. She canceled my show and left the itchy dreamers of the region with no outlet, no airwaves, no listeners, no disembodied voice beckoning them to unload the lingering memories of weird and disturbing dreams. Trudy knew damn well I was a vegetarian and had been since the first mad cow scare. About the only things I could eat at Joe's dead cow emporium were fried mozzarella sticks and hush puppies. I would have eaten fish, but none were on offer. I sat there, huddled there, beneath faux antique wagon wheels, branding irons, cow skulls, and horns. And Trudy ordered a pitcher of beer for the two of us and told me that my skills were wasted in talk radio. I had no idea what skills she was referring to, and I'm sure neither did she. Trudy claimed she wanted to let me down gently, but I knew better. I knew that she was worried I would reveal what I knew of her dreams. People can rationalize all they want about the workings of the unconscious, but the truth is that we all feel somewhat responsible for the content of our dreams. And if our dreams are kinky or perverted or repulsive, and Trudy's were all of these, then it must be inferred that we are kinky, perverted, or repulsive as well. So I'll stop reading there. And, um, Because in the story at the Abelardo that we meet in the prologue, 
um, comes up to see Alice, who has just lost her job at Waldo. And the reason he has come to, up to um, up, upstate New York is because he's doing research in order to make a case for his great aunt to be canonized, to become the first Nicaraguan sort of homegrown saint. And something happens, and he can't, I, which I won't say. Um, and he ends up having to go back to Nicaragua, and Alice sort of takes over this quest for him and then ends up going back to Nicaragua. So I'm still going to answer your question. Once I was in Nicaragua with, um, I, I used to do business down there, and uh, there were always like lots of men and engineers, and they were always, they always struck me as so much more serious than me, and I was always really trying very hard to be serious and be a part of that, but not very successfully. And once we were in this really small plane and lost, I didn't know that at the time, which is a good thing. <laughs> and this man that I knew pulled out of his pocket. Um, I, he pulled his wa <clears throat> wallet out of his pocket, and he had this tiny little, like the size of my fingernail, scrap of white fabric. And it was cut from the underwear of a nun, a Nicaraguan nun, who had recently <laughs> died. And there was the anticipation that this would be a relic, presumed. It would be an official relic, presumed she got canonized. And I was just shocked. I, <laughs> this was a very, um, you know, very successful businessman. I mean, he was, his mother-in-law was the president of the country. And I thought this was one of the strangest things, and somehow that stayed in my brain. Um, that doesn't actually end up in the story, but that's what got me going. How long did it take you to write the book? Too long, probably about four years. I'm really slow. Do you have to um, be away somewhere to write, or do you write in your normal environment? No, I have an office in my house, which is very nice, so I'm lucky about that. Um, I mean, I, I, I've written in other places, but I just like a whole lot of all. It's good. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you, you work in Nicaragua. Is there a reason or a special connection why in Nicaragua? Or, or um, it was just a, a chance you got there? We, it, we, um, it was involved with my family. We had different businesses in Nicaragua that my father was involved with for years. And so we just, it's a great country. I reckon everybody should go to Toronto. Um, What's my next question? What about the Toronto plants? I really like the people. It's, it's, it's a very, um, it's a beautiful country. I mean, it's as beautiful as any other, um, uh, you know, popular tourist attraction, except it has terrible politics and a horrible infrastructure. And they've been plagued by American invasions and, um, despots and greedy dictators and I could go on. But it's still a great country and the people there if you were ever invited to a party with Nicaraguans go. They are the best partiers. Um, and they're also very, very devout in the most bizarre ways that I that you can you can imagine. <laughs> Yeah. Do dreams continue to play a part in the book? Well, they do, um, because Alice has two sons, and one of her sons often tells his dreams. He's a little unusual that way. But not too much, because I've discovered that actually most people really don't like to hear dreams. They just like to, the concept is more interesting than the reality. So I think that's enough. Thank you very much. Oh.